Victorian beauty ideals were obsessed with one thing, pallor. Now what pallor is, is basically the trend where upper class white women try to make themselves look whiter. You know, that riveting pasty look. Hi friends, I'm Megan from Forge Soap Co, formerly Figs and Feathers Farm. And here are 10 shocking Victorian skin regimes. And I mean, and I mean shocking. shocking. In 1898, a new magical element was discovered, a source of energy and brightness that both delighted and fascinated people, known as radium. It was used in all sorts of products, from cigarettes, condoms, toothpaste, makeup, suppositories, hair creams, food items, in health spas, and in quack medical therapies, due to its supposed curative powers. Curative powers, radium. Now, if you didn't know, radium is a key source of radiation poisoning, and some of its side effects are anemia, cancer, and even genetic mutations. So, you know, run down to the corner market and pick yourself up some face makeup that has been laced with radium. Oh boy. As stated in one of my previous videos, 31 random facts you probably didn't need to know. I will link it below. There is a popular product sold in the Victorian era that were known as complexion wafers. And what complexion wafers were, they were little white chalk wafers that were filled with arsenic that were meant for snacking. Mm, delicious. Sears and Roebuck was one of the big sellers of this product. It was known as Dr. Rose's arsenic complexion wafers. They also sold a very special soap that was also made with arsenic. Now, why would anybody want to eat arsenic complexion wafers or bathe themselves in arsenic? Well, that goes back to that whole idea of pallor. People in the Victorian age, particularly women, were very drawn to having white and translucent skin. It was considered high class. Victorian era depilatories were also often made from ingredients like arsenic and quicklime and alkaline lye. Alkaline lye. And the really interesting thing is that Victorian women, they knew that it was toxic and they knew that it was addictive, but that didn't really stop the quest for this perfect complexion. In fact, it was not uncommon for it to be used as a poisoning agent by murderesses of the era. Lead-based makeups and paints had been popular long before the Victorian era. However, the popularity continued to rise in the 19th century, covering your face, arms, and chest, and any other pieces of skin that were shown became exceptionally popular. However, the corrosive nature of lead actually led to many more skin problems, which of course you have to pile on more makeup to cover up. Some women even covered their face in what was known as Venetian ceruse, which was a paint made by mixing together lead and vinegar. Cosmetics of the time were considered very expensive, so most women would skip face washing altogether, instead choosing to go to bed with their makeup on and making it last as long as possible. This paint was also used to cover up disfigurements such as smallpox. And after many, many applications over several days or several weeks, you can imagine what that looked like. These thick layers of makeup cracked like porcelain if a woman became too expressive. So that was the thing. You go to a social event, make sure you're not smiling, you're not laughing, because man, how mortifying would it be if somebody saw your 7,000 layers of lead painted makeup crack? In the 1860s, the American face lotion, Laird's Bloom of Youth or Liquid Pearl, promised to whiten skin, helping ladies that were afflicted with tan. Can you imagine being afflicted with tan? freckles or rougher discolored skin. Victorian women of the time really strived for natural beauty and it was very much a secret if women decided to wear makeup and a woman would never admit willingly to wearing any sort of makeup. However, some brazen women out there that would wear a compound on their eyes called eye paint. This was mostly found in shades of red and black. Eye paints contained lead tetroxide and antimony oxide, both of which are considered highly toxic to humans. Some ladies line their eyes with a substance called cinnabar. Cinnabar was used to create a vermilion red, which contains mercuric sulfides, which can cause kidney damage. It is interesting to note that mercury-based skin creams are still sold illegally, but they're still sold in the United States and many other countries. 
Victorian women looking to add a little bit of red or rouge to their lips turn to something called carmine. The pigment itself comes from the cochineal beetle, a parasitic insect native to South America and Mexico. The pigment is often extracted by grinding the insect bodies into a fine powder and mixing it with ammonia. Carmine, surprisingly, is still used to this day in both cosmetic and food applications and is actually considered a natural dye. If sparse eyebrows or eyelashes plagued you, a quick wash with a mercury compound was recommended before bed. Now, as a side note, false eyelashes came to be during the Victorian era, and let's just say they used human hair that was actually sewn into the eyelid. Chestnut brown was a highly desired hair color of the time. Women seeking to lighten their locks would reach for something called oil of vitriol, which was basically just sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid can easily burn when coming into direct contact with skin, and it was actually found by some studies to dissolve hair completely. The regular use of x-rays as a hair removal method began around the turn of the 20th century. An Austrian physician first began recommending it as use for excess body hair and quote, Hair begins to fall out in thick tufts when lightly grasped or to seen on the towel after the patient's toilet. He observed in 1899, this practice of using an x-ray machine as a type of depilatory actually lasted in commercial salon settings for almost five decades before it was outlawed. We now know x-rays have been led to all sorts of health complications, including many types of cancers and even death. If the name of the game in the 1800s was to look fragile and delicate and on the brink of death, Victorian women didn't miss a beat. In order to create that glassy red eye look that a person with a fever has, women would put belladonna droplets into their eyes. Now belladonna, if you didn't know, is a poisonous plant, also known as deadly nightshade. The idea behind putting drops of belladonna in your eyes was to keep them bright and fresh. But immediate side effects include blurred vision, light sensitivity, and in some rare cases, blindness. Citrus or perfume were also thought to help keep the eyes looking fresh. It was said that Queen Victoria herself used the drops as an alternative to cataract surgery. One of the most popular basic skincare fads of the time was mixing together opia, ammonia, and mercury. Women were often encouraged to slather on coats of this blend. This was often followed by a wash of ammonia. Alexis Carl, a perfumer who has researched Victorian cosmetics extensively, noted the look of the consumptive was very desirable. The woman with watery eyes and pale skin, which of course was from the cadaver in the throes of death. According to Carl, the symptomatic pale skin of consumptives was associated with innocence, beauty, and above all else, wealth. Contracting tuberculosis had other benefits as well. The watery eyes, the narrow waist, the translucent complexion of tuberculosis victims was highly prized and women with the disease were considered to have ethereal beauty. The Victorians certainly romanticized the disease and the effects it caused in the gradual build to death. Many of today's consumers like to think that we're smarter than those of the Victorian age. And while there have been many improvements, it is hard to miss the contemporary parallels between now and then. Beauty tips, skincare tips we get from influencers and blogs and vlogs and people in the MLM game. We have just as much potential for risky treatments now as we did then. We like to think that we're smarter, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we are. Food for thought. Thanks so much, friends, for hanging out. Come back next time as we talk more soap making, skincare, and random small business adventures. Uncommon to be used. In fact, in fact, in fact, in fact. Bathing in springs, bathing and soaking in arsenic in arsenic baths that were bathing in arsenic the number you have dialed has been changed the new number is